Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, the UK economy has been making the headlines in recent weeks with Jeremy Hunt's new non-domicile rules and some big names leaving the London Stock Exchange. But what could this mean for Ireland? The Business Post, new UK correspondent Dominic McGrath, joins us now to discuss these events in more detail. Dominic, congratulations on your recent appointment. I'd like to take you back to 2016 when you started working with the BBC. As soon as you walked through the doors of that British institution, they said to you, you're now working with the BBC and the BBC never gets anything wrong. What went through your mind at the time? <laughs> I was quite nervous. I think when you walk into an organisation like that, you're always aware of the kind of august history of organisations like the BBC. I think, you know, public service, broadcasting. And so, you know, I started out there as an intern. I came back a few years later, you know, working as a, as a broadcast journalist to kind of be trunch point of um, the Brexit negotiations when we were all here, you know, talking about the border. And I worked in, in dairy right along the border. And so it was a real, a real good insight, I suppose, into covering, you know, in many ways, a small part of the world within the broader, larger apparatus of, um, you know, the global BBC. So it was a, a really interesting opportunity to work there at that time. And Dominic, the UK economy has always been of interest to Ireland and on many occasions has had a major influence on our economy. So what's happening in the UK economy right now that we should be some way concerned about? So the UK economy is, you know, clearly um, of massive, massive interest for for Ireland. You know, um, I was speaking to um, Michael McGrath, the finance minister, um, last week, and he, you know, made clear to me when I put it to him that, uh, look, the UK economy is in a quite a poor state. There's not that much growth, and he insisted that despite that, you know, it's still such a key market. It's one of the places where um, you know Irish businesses often look to expand first, for you know very obvious reasons that we all know in terms of um, culture, in terms of language. But I think when you look at um, in recent in recent years, um, you know where Irish companies have done well, whether it's you know. In, in tech, obviously, in um, financial services here in the city in London, but of course, even across um, areas we don't talk about as much. So um, local authorities, for instance, and local councils um, here in the UK. So I think it's, it's one of those things where there are plenty of opportunities, but I think um, as an Irish observer, it is remarkable the kind of, um, the kind of dire straits um, of the UK economy going forward. You know, the growth prospects for the UK are not good. It's only, high inflation is only just um, starting to come down. There's speculation that the Bank of England might be able to um, start cutting rates. But again, um, the picture for beyond the next election is very difficult when it comes to um, the public finances here. Very, very tight. And that's something that we saw um, alluded to, um, if not uh, addressed head on in Jeremy Hunt's UK Chancellor's budget this month. Yes, and talk to us about Jeremy Hunt's non dom shake up and if it can be of any benefit to us here in Ireland. Yeah, so the non dom tax regime has always been a source of controversy in a very kind of clear left right Labour Conservative um, split traditionally. Um, so the Tories have always said the current um, non-DOM regime has been, you know, a, a great benefit for attracting wealthy individuals. Um, that any tweaks or changes would actually, you know, lead to an exodus of wealthy people or put wealthy people off coming to the UK. And of course, many of these people are um, in the finance industry. Um, you know, uh, perhaps linked to um, you know, the City of London. Um, and Labour actually had said that it would, if it wins Paris next election, which many people see as very likely, it would abolish um, the non-DOM tax regime. Now, what happened in the budget is that there was a leak, I think first reported by the Financial Times, that Jeremy Hunt would, um, he would actually steal effectively Labour's policy and, uh, and abolish the non-DOM tax regime himself, which he then did. Uh, on budget day, which is quite remarkable, a quite remarkable reversal by the Tories. It creates a massive political headache for Labour. Um, and effectively, from April 2025, they're going to have a system where new arrivals to the UK will pay the same tax as everyone else after four years. So quite a quite a significant shake-up. Um, reformers haven't have kind of welcomed it. 
um, have said it's a uh, a good change, but perhaps it could have gone further in ensuring that you know investment actually does go to go to the UK's uh, coffers potentially. But a few people have suggested that this change could actually see Ireland benefit if Ireland doesn't make any changes to its current um, remittance basis that some wealthy individuals could actually pick Ireland as an attractive option compared to the UK. And it remains to be seen. Not everyone agrees with that. People I've spoken to have said they might go somewhere else, perhaps Paris or Frankfurt. But it is a possibility. And I put that to, um, to Michael McGraw when I spoke to him for the Business Post um, recently. And he, he unsurprisingly would not be drawn on it. But um, we'll see. We'll see what happens maybe in the next 12 months or so. And of course, the effects of Brexit have now well and truly filtered through the UK economy. So what is the sentiment amongst the business community about Brexit right now? I think one of the challenges for the UK when it comes to Brexit is that it's in many ways unfinished business. Um, and despite, you know, there being a, you know, Boris Johnson's Brexit deal, the trade and cooperation agreement, despite the Windsor framework, Easing, um, easing the kind of trade uh, between um, Northern Ireland and um, the rest of the UK. Um, despite better relations coming from that um, Windsor Framework Agreement, it's it's still um, it still is an element, I think, of just uncertainty and not knowing entirely what's coming next. Um, and again, you know, the, you know, as I say, there are. That's not to play down the fact that there has been a lot of progress. Um, we've seen, you know, Britain introducing um, border checks um, on imports eventually, very, very belatedly, um, which was a concern, of course, to Irish businesses. But they seem to be going relatively smoothly so far, although there are further checks um, uh, yet to come in over the over this coming coming few months. We'll see how they go. Uh, but I think what 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 the main challenge is is that we're going to have a likely a Labour government coming in after the um, next election. Now, Labour, it's a a difficult issue for them when it comes to the European Union. Um, They have to tread very carefully. They don't want to go back into the single market. They don't want to go back into the customs union. They definitely don't want to rejoin the EU. But they have said they will try and get a better deal for the UK now. If they do, if the EU EU, um, wants to play ball on that, it remains to be seen. But I think in many ways, I think lots of businesses, you think you just want some kind of stability and predictability, which you know I think has been missing for the last decade or so, uh, last eight years. And what difference will a Labour government in power in the UK have for Ireland? I think one of the really interesting things that I've uh, been starting to look into in, in my role here in the Business Post is actually Labour's um, green investment plan. So... Labour initially had a, a plan um, to ramp up to 28 billion a year in terms of green investment. Now they've watered that down quite considerably, but they still have much more ambitious um, green policies than the Conservatives, and they want to get um, to clean power by 2030. Um, so it's quite a remarkable um, push by Labour, and I think what that will be really interesting is that. What does that mean for uh, green um, Irish businesses, uh, green tech, all that kind of thing, renewable energy, and actually can our Irish businesses get involved in that? Um, and does that create opportunities here in the UK market? So, you know, there have been a lot of um, a lot of kind of criticisms of the Conservatives recently in terms of uh, rowing back on green pledges, rowing back on net zero, and I think if Labour come in and they do actually commit. To quite an ambitious green program, uh, not on the scale, of course, of you know what we've seen with the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. under Joe Biden, but at least something perhaps inspired by that. It could actually create some big opportunities for Irish green companies. And Dominic, what challenges are facing the London Stock Exchange right now? So the London Stock Exchange um, has, for a long time, been been struggling. It's quite beleaguered, and that's because a lot of large companies have um, just delisted. Um, and they have decamped elsewhere now, mostly to um, to New York. Um, and some of the, um, you know, there is there's an optimism among the um, London Stock Exchange group. They think that actually the tide is turning uh, and actually they will see um, more IPOs in the next 12 months or so. And there was some recent speculation that Sheen, the fast fashion giant, could potentially list on the London Stock Exchange 
quite a few issues over um, a listing in, in the U.S. and some concerns in Washington over ties uh, to, to China. Um, but now that would be a major boost for, for London. Um, I mean, and the figures, as I suggested, are, are pretty, pretty stark. I mean, only 23 firms listed in London last year, and that was a 49% drop on 2022. So it really is, um, they really are crying out for some good news when it comes to new listings here in London. And on a broader note, your journalism career started out back in 2016 with the BBC. But how has the world of journalism changed since you started in the profession almost eight years ago? I think in many ways it's a consolidation of some of the trends we've seen for you know, the last um, two decades. You know, having to adapt to the rise of social media, the, the turbulences of, um, of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all these new platforms. And you have seen that, you know, constant puzzle of media, media organizations, you know, trying to adapt to the latest trend. And, uh, you know, I know plenty of journalists who are now, you know, posting on TikTok, for instance, and trying to see how that can be used as a platform to, um, to highlight journalism. But in many ways, you know, some of it is also what we know and we've known for a long time, you know, the the shift to online and creating sustainable um, journalism model online. And we've seen lots of, I think, more creative thinking um, in the years since I started out as a journalist. You know, when I started out, it was a lot of it was um, quite apocalyptic. Um, I think for young journalists, there was a sense that, you know, this industry is, is really struggling. And since then, we've seen, you know, the New York Times, for instance, create a hugely sustainable model um, based on subscriptions. Um, and I think that's kind of given people hope um, that there is a model out there that actually can be sustainable. Um, I think lots of media organizations have been just experimenting perhaps in more creative ways. And obviously, you know, we've got things like AI that are giving perhaps new tools to journalists, whether it's, you know, transcription services to make life perhaps more easier when it comes to writing articles um, or just, you know, people, people able to shoot video and write articles entirely on mobile phones. I think that's kind of the change that I've seen in my career. And of course, Twitter, now X, has always been a very useful tool for journalists. But how has it changed since Elon Musk has taken over there? It's, it's quite sad, actually. So, I mean, I think if anyone knows any journalists, they spend most of their time on X or on, on Twitter, as I still call it. Um, and it really is, and it was, I suppose, an invaluable, an invaluable tool but now under Elon Musk, you do see you know, nearly every day just the deterioration of, of quality on the website. Certain tools linked to Twitter um, are just no longer usable or you, know, you have to pay exorbitant amounts for them. So it just really has reduced the use. And lots of the people who would have been very useful on it, lots of kind of the ac- experts and, uh, from around the world simply aren't using it. They've just abandoned the platform because it has just become... A lot more, a lot more toxic, um, with a lot less good quality kind of discussions. So yeah, it's been a real shame actually um, watching it kind of decline. I think lots of journalists my age wouldn't really know what to do um, if Twitter or X disappeared overnight. As we live in a world of mass distraction, do you think that there's still an appetite for long form journalism in today's media environment? I really do, and I think in many ways, you know. Long form, long form journalism is actually increasingly important um, in kind of helping to explain the really difficult trends, the really difficult factors that are really shaping our world. I think, um, and I think you know, I think the the um, the referendums, um, of course, that we had uh, here, um, you know, this month go to show that things are complicated. Things are complex and I think it's actually the kind of long form deeper journalism that people actually want they don't want um, the kind of short snappy answers I think people are do want to engage I think it's just presenting that in in the right way and presenting it in the best way to an audience but I think I do think increasingly you know audiences want well written um, well informed uh, well researched journalism that I hope we do at the Business Post and finally, Dominic, what might the future of journalism look like? <laughs> Robots. No, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, I think, I mean, I hope the future of journalism is is one that's you know sustainable and positive, and that we see um, 
an industry that is able to, you know, combat some of the, the misinformation that we see. And I, but I think, and I, 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 don't, I, don't, I can't really give a straightforward answer. I think, I think it depends on, on, you know, journalism being able to find a sustainable model for kind of the, the 21st century. Um, and I think that it all depends on that. I think that's still a, still a work in progress. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Dominic McGrath, the UK correspondent for the Business Post. And Dominic's insights into the UK economy will be interesting to watch in the coming months. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.